Matthew 7, 2 states, For with whatever judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with whatever measure you measure, it will be measured to you. So why do most of us judge others so harshly? Interesting. I think that's an excellent question. It's an excellent way to put it. Yeah. Because there's judge not lest ye be judged. And I don't know where that appears, but this fleshes it out a lot better. I, I think our friend Inna would be best address this. <laughs> Who would? Inna, uh, oh. whose background is uh, uh, psychoanalytics. Oh, because I, I think it, it's really a, a psychoanalytic question, and and has to do probably with insecurity and the need for control. Yes, it's also about uh, it's also about karma. Um, Can you say uh, more about that? Well, you know, whatever you do will come back to you. Um, okay. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, and it's just, it lays it out pretty clearly that you get what you give. <laughs> so if you want abundance, give, which a lot of radio preachers have made a lot of money off of. But that's another story. Right. I also feel that harshness towards others when judging others is also reflective of the harshness towards oneself. Um, and sometimes it's easy to pay attention to that, some, but most of the times it's something that is um, sort of ignored because I feel much to your point about karma, it's like you see what you are and you yeah. get what you give. Um, so when we are around certain people that we judge harshly, it's actually something to explore within ourselves first. Right. Right. And I think, I think people who are very judgmental probably have a whole lot of ideas about the way they're supposed to be. They may have convinced themselves that they're already that way in some cases, but I think, I think that's the case. I know, I know I have a lot of ideas about how and who I should be that I don't know until something pops up to reveal them. Okay, well, now, now that we've blamed all these people for being judgmental, uh, teehee, uh, <laughs> how, how can one resolve the problem? What, what needs to be made societally, culturally to change that would resolve that? More empathy. Yeah, that's a good start. Um, you know, and also, why is it that we don't learn somehow early in life that the answer to why does that person do that is likely to be found in yourself. Um, yes, why don't we know that? I don't know. Well, because nobody teaches it. Even this, you know, Bible verse doesn't actually teach that. Um, but the question, why do we judge others harshly, you know, could lead there. Mm -hmm. a a any other views on how, how we might change this? Because this, um, this is a problem with, at the very heart of the species. Yeah, you have to get people to care to understand themselves, for one thing. Well, okay. How, how is that conducted? Ah, uh, boy, I don't know. Just encourage questioning. I, I mean, I don't know. I think a lot of it has to do with attitude. Um, it does. On the one hand, you shouldn't harshly judge others. On the other hand, they say criticism's the highest form of flattery. So here's the thing. Are you willing to judge someone uh, openly to their faith in order to help them and also willing to receive feedback from that person that tells you that you may be wrong and right. then change yourself? Or are you just willy-nilly going around judging everybody, including people you've never met before in your life, which people seem to be doing a whole hell of a lot of these days? Yeah. Well, I think the kind of criticism you're referring to is really showing that you care, not that you don't like. Um, you might want to correct somebody because you think they'll get in trouble with that. Uh, or, you know, you might want to understand the person better. You might want to try to convince them of something that you think is good for them. 
But that's a slippery slope because all those Bible thumpers think that's what they're doing. You know, let's use a pretty egregious example. Let's say someone you know is a heroin addict. Rather than just idly judging them and saying they're a terrible person, you could have an open dialogue with them, talk to them, ask them why and how they became an addict, and then offer to help them. You can be a bit harsh with them. I mean, be, being too lenient is never going to help anybody. Uh, but you also shouldn't be harsh. You should come into it with a loving and open heart and lots of tenderness. Um, yeah, you shouldn't compromise yourself in order to have that inter interaction. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be learned from addict. And learning about addiction, you really learn, gives you a lot of insight into your own behavior patterns. Uh, uh, okay, folks, but but now we're still doing the same thing. We're talking about how people should act and how they should be different uh, and what value there is in doing things this way. And, and what I want to know is what are the fundamental changes we could make in in the culture, in education, that, that would stop this aggression, uh, identifying well, others as, as, as different and therefore uh, threatening? Well, I, I think the first step is, is simply uh, being face to face with people. Um, there, there, there was a film made, a French film made in the 1970s uh, about uh, the Vietnam War. It's called A Cat Without a Grin. It was talking about you know basically how many more egregious things were happening because you know, people were, pilots were dropping napalm and didn't really see the faces of the people they were killing. Um, right. I think the same thing is happening on social media today. I think yes. when you're, you have distance from the person you're criticizing, it's much, much easier to say horrible things and to cancel them and to judge them and all this. Um, whereas if you're talking to someone face to face, even if you have the most staunch, let's say, progressive and the staunchest conservative, you know it would be surprising. It's surprising to people today. Actually, they can be very dear friends and they can actually come to some sort of understanding if only they talk face to face. You know, there's a saying in Bosnian that all things are solved over a cup of coffee. Yeah, in person. Yeah, great. Yes, exactly. Well, you know, also, I mean, if you're just throwing comments back and forth on the internet, then you don't know the person at all. You just know the text that you see. And uh, <clears throat> you don't realize even the depth of what you're doing. All you think, All you think of is the particular thing you said at the time. But in, in person, it's possible to see that something you say has hurt someone or frightened them or, um, or pleased them. And you don't get that from, you know, keyboard and screen. It's a problem with email too, but uh, more so on places like Twitter and comment sections on websites and stuff like that. You know, there, there's a lot to be said, at least efficiency wise about how the internet could be was and could be good for business for instance you know I, yeah. i'm not saying personally that i like it or don't like it i'm just saying there's an argument to be made on the other hand i really don't think that any good comes from social networking i i think it is evil in our life okay what and, makes it evil and, what makes it evil is the uh, absence of the humanity that Communi you communicate in person. Right. It, 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 it's, it's like handing, handing a gun to a mentally unstable uh, person that doesn't know how to use it. Uh, it's, it's not like the gun itself is necessarily evil, but the evil that happens because of it is evil. And I just don't think we as a species are meant to spend so much time interacting with others in this manner, staring yes. at screens and what. Uh, uh, again, yeah. li like I said, I'm not trying to be judgmental here. There's an argument to be made that doing work in this way is efficient and all of that. But like to actually 
spend hours and hours of one's day flicking through photos and chit chatting and all of this kind of stuff, superfluous stuff with social media. It's actually very, very detrimental to one's happiness, mental health, stability, development. And I think we're seeing that a lot with today's uh, youth, that they have fewer and fewer kids able to uh, have friends or to socialize properly. There are hundreds of friends online, but they're bullying back and forth between yeah. one another. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's look, look. May, maybe I'm wrong, and I'm sure I'm sure there's always exceptions. But in general, I I think that um, let's just put it mildly: social networking has done more harm than good. And it's not like refrigerators or vaccines or something yeah. that have <laughs> done a lot of good. I, I don't see the human necessity for social networking. Well, social networking is not a good in itself, and uh, keeping your food from rotting is probably a good in itself. Um, but I, I sometimes think of this as a bandwidth problem. Mm -hmm. Like person to person, we can communicate a lot more. Restricting you to yourself to text exchanges is like having a whole bunch of your vocabulary cut out, you know? It's, it's like in text, we don't have the ability to communicate certain feelings and things like that, or to respond instantly to discover, you know, when you see that someone is, is misunderstanding what you say and things like that. There's just a lot more bandwidth, um, and there's room in that bandwidth for a cup of coffee. But it's an impoverished communication. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's a, a counterfeit in a certain way. I mean, if you look at the way people used to write letters, they're works of art, a lot, most of them, or a lot of them. I said absolutely. So, so, yeah. so, some of the uh, letters of various writers are, are as good or better than their actual uh, published writings. Yes. Well, and it presumes that you either know the recipient well, uh, or at least thoroughly accept their humanity and legitimacy. And with the low bandwidth channel, there's some things you can communicate really well, you know, like hatred, <laughs> violent feelings, things that make a lot of noise, <laughs> but the subtleties don't get through. No. And the higher things don't get through. They're not necessarily subtle. You just have to see them. In, you know, I've had a conversation with a few people, and, and I've also done this myself. I mean, because I personally don't use any form of social networking. I just, you know, um, said, you know, if, if I know a person and they're not willing to take the time to at least talk to me every couple of months on the phone or email me occasionally, then why should I have that person in my life? And I've told someone, I said, why don't you uh, disable uh, your social networking uh, profiles for a couple months and then tell people, hey, I'm still around. Give me a call, email me. <laughs> Here's my email address. And you know what? I've gotten uh, people coming back to me after doing this and they say, said, yeah, I thought I had 500 friends. I didn't realize I don't even have two. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. What Facebook calls a friend is not the same thing as what people used to mean or usually mean by friend. Yes. That term has changed a bit. Yes. Well, friend now means people that approve of you enough to uh, be associated with you. It doesn't have anything to do with any thing else other than being on the person's list. I mean, I've seen people that have you know, hundreds of friends, and I don't recognize that they were celebrities, but they obviously work really hard <laughs> mm -hmm. at getting a large number of friends. And of course, you can wear that as a badge of honor on social media. How many people follow you? How many you know, Facebook friends do you have? It's another replacement of quality by quantity. I don't like social media. <laughs> you know, I created a Twitter account. I created a Facebook account and I, I send messages from Facebook to a folder I almost never look at because I don't want to communicate that way.
So, I, I, you know, I can use it if I have to, but I hope not to have to. Not to mention as someone that cares about language, you know, obviously language always evolves. It always changes. Uh, not every change, not everything that's new is some sort of degeneracy. But I would say when you completely disregard the roles of spelling and grammar and even uh, lose the basic ability to make things make sense, then yeah. you're on a slippery slope. And frankly, what social media is doing to the our language is disconcerting, to say yes. the least. Yes, yes, I agree. I remember when the first smiley faces started appearing on the internet. That was probably in the 80s. <laughs> and... Uh, <clears throat> And I thought, oh, that's nice. You can communicate a, a friend, something friendly. But look at all the emojis we have now. It's just a, it's a mess. And the, um, the abbreviations that people have chosen uh, to save keystrokes are invading our language ever more every day. And I, I kind of think that language as a collective thing, at its best, when it changes, it moves sideways. Um, Oh, could you dilate on that a little? What I mean is it neither ascends nor descends. It just adjusts. Oh, um, okay. And uh, that I don't think on a collective scale, you can very easily raise the level of the language. I mean, I'm sure it has happened. You know, when the people who spoke the language had uh, people that they would like to emulate that, you know, took joy in the art of communication, committing, communicating and demonstrated its value but otherwise i think an ascent in language only happens in you know smaller groups specialized you know pockets here and there where the people are interested in something that they need they really need certain things to communicate you know they have to work out how to how to do that because they're it's not just Hey, how many eggs do we have? Do we, I need to get some at the store? Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm just thinking, you know, uh, you, you, you take Hemingway or Lawrence or, or even someone more recent like Cormac McCarthy and you send their books in a time machine back to Shakespeare. I think he could really get the gist of most of what they're talking about. Send mm -hmm. a, a chat transcript from people. Uh, back to Shakespeare, he'd be like, wait, some of these words look like English, but they must be spoken by Martian invaders that don't know yeah, any. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, you know, Shakespearean English is already more difficult than common English. And uh, if you go back earlier and, you know, earlier forms, you can tell that it's, uh, well, you can tell that it's a Germanic language in the English direction. But, you know, with language changing fast, it becomes hard for tradition. It becomes hard for things to be passed down from generation to generation. So, I mean, I don't think you could give uh, the average high school student uh, the assignment to read Carlyle's essays or something like that. They would probably pull their hair out trying to read it. I, I love that you gave that as an example. When, when I was teaching <laughs> many years ago, I actually gave them Carlyle's essays and they they couldn't make heads or tails of them, which I thought yes. was very bad. Yeah, it's both the difference in the language and the use of unfamiliar in ordinary life concept. Um, and also, people are lazy. They don't think they should have to work to understand anything. So, you know, understanding is not a social value. It's a personal value some people have. You know, I suppose if children in school were asked questions, you know, regarding uh, the behavior that they observed in others and were given the question, why do you suppose that person does that? Why do you, you know... Uh, what do you suppose they believe that that you know that behavior fits in with that maybe you don't believe? But wouldn't it be nice to know what that was? <laughs> and some people would say no, 
but kids have more curiosity than adults for the most part and and that's what you need you need some curiosity and, and it should be made into a, a a habit for use in adulthood uh during childhood no curiosity no you know and then there's a class of people that i suppose you could call the lower class the shudra or whatever um who really only value concrete things you know what can i get what can i you know what does it cost how do i get what i want rather than how do i learn to do something new uh, well, you know yeah. there, there is a person there is a type of person that's just cannot even soar to the heights of a third story building uh well maybe i should say it's a one story building um <laughs> and you know uh, you have to have compassion for those people but don't cast your pearls before swine or at least don't expect them to do anything other than act like swine i mean there are people people like that i wouldn't want to characterize a whole class of people as being that way but i have beheld that in people and it looks to me like i see it play out on the world stage too but since i don't know those people i can't say well similarly while we're complaining about things uh, uh a, a number of the uh russian jewish women who, uh, who, who work for the company uh have children in high school and i'm just astounded at how completely quantitative that experience has become it doesn't seem to be about character or values i mean it's all about about grades and test scores and that's all there that's all it is yeah it's quantitative i i remember many years ago suddenly realizing that the conversation that one hears around one say in a restaurant uh -huh. had changed to in in the direction of people talking a whole lot more about money and the cost of things and i was just you know surprised to realize that you know people's con conversation was almost commercial um you know, it was just about concrete things and what you can afford and what you can't and what you'd like to have. And always nice, though, when you overhear somebody doing something differently, which I was at a restaurant some not that many years ago, um, and there were these men talking at a table nearby, and I had I had to meet them. You know, they were they were clearly spiritual people and uh, one was a priest and you know the others were in the same church and this is where they went every day after church service but it was just so nice they wouldn't have agreed with me about a lot of things but there were people they were people that valued certain essentials that we you know lose at our own peril and now you hear, hear people talking about the internet all the time i remember when i first noticed that in a restaurant i said oh my god the thieves have the internet uh, it's downhill from here. <laughs> Indeed. But you, you, you know, Sheikh Al Bashir, you're right. I, I mean, you know how much I like to be right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the 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 way schooling is done is all quantitative. I basically, focus only on math and science, and then kids get home more math, more science. All around you see math and science centers, but not any English or language centers. Occasionally yeah. a music center, uh, but that's an aberration. And you have all these meetup groups and everything for math and science and all of this. Good luck finding one for poetry. But, but yeah. see, I, I, I remember that going back to my high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and my high school had a distinguished marching band. And I remember parents saying, you know, what? Why should their kids study music? What you know? What are they going to do with that? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And and now it's much worse. It's it's much worse because, men in many states they don't even teach kids cursive. They uh, no, They're barely gone. barely teach kids printing. They let kids get by with being essentially functionally illiterate. Uh, good luck exposing them to Shakespeare uh, because they can't even read Orwell or Huxley or Moby Dick, you know? Uh, you know, 
fine, fine. Let's just say Shakespeare's on the other side of the pond. Kids should know the great works of the tradition of this country, Thoreau, uh, Melville, Emerson. They can't read it. They can't understand it. They're lucky if they can read Hemingway's Old Man in the Sea. Um, but yet they're trained specifically for occupational things, math and yeah. science and reading in order to do math and science. And, and even, even science, you know, tends to be mostly technology. Ex exactly, exactly. Not even the more interesting and more valuable uh, uh, and nourishing uh, theoretical stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, th this is disturbing. I I'm not saying there shouldn't be people going into math or science or technology, oh, but course. what you're having now is actually a situation where people can't choose and people can't develop their talents freely because even when you have kids that are talent would be talented in art or language, uh, they're basically uh, shoehorned into the one and only group of uh, careers that yeah. are viewed as lucrative. So they don't get to make a choice. The choice is made for them, which is not a good thing. And it's, it's worse in this country because uh, in, in Europe, there's still to a certain extent, I mean, multiple language languages being taught. Um, and, you know, simply, I, I've talked to a lot of people in Europe and, and you know, simply the fact that uh, health insurance is not tied to employment allows yeah. someone to be an artist. And they might not be doing well financially, but they don't have fear every single day of their life that they yeah. won't have to eat or that they'll go bankrupt or die if they, you know, uh, uh, don't have some health insurance. So, um, it's just the situation here is rather lacking in compassion. And it also, even more so in, than that, doesn't allow people to, to what? create. Well, it, it's, I find it interesting and, and ironic that here in one of the world's largest countries, it's possible to live in a very, very small world. And in Europe, they have the advantage that not very far from them is another language, another culture, another, uh, you know, things that are different. Uh, and you rub shoulders from people from those different places and you know that they're people. And that that's just got to be really helpful, you know, to see yourself as one possibility among others and your culture as one possibility among others. But think about that. I, I mean, you're in Bloomington, Sheikh Al Bashir, you're in New York. I mean, e even outside of that, even in rural areas, you've, I mean, I, I was in Wyoming in the middle of nowhere and my battery died and I needed a, a jump. And the person that came and helped was an immigrant from Ghana. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm just saying you're experiencing those to other cultures, but there's something blocking many, many people here from actually learning and understanding those cultures. I mean, so many people here are native Spanish speakers, but yet very few people ever take the time to actually become fluent in English and Spanish. Yes. You know, it's one thing that has impressed me once again, again and again, is when there are a lot of world events going on and a lot of uh, different world actors participating you uh you get to see a lot of that um you get you know you get the french president's point of view you get you know even though it's just geopolitics you know it's just nice to hear a lot of people say the same thing in their own way and uh people are finding themselves sort of involuntarily having to uh, uh, empathize a little with the Ukrainians, which is, a, I think, a good argument for being a lot more open about war. I think that's one of the reasons that people choose the career of war correspondents, you know, because they, they really think people should know. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, there have been four of them killed, uh, I think. That's right. Fox News people. Just, and, uh, oh, I didn't know movies. that. Yeah, I think it, all four were, recent ones were Fox News. I know there were more than one. Yeah, four different 
correspondence. Uh, but, not, but not all from the same network, right? Yeah, no, from from Fox. Oh wow, that's, Fox. that's the way I that's the way I read it. Um, wow. It's going to make it hard for them to ignore the world, the war, which is good. But you know, I had to stop and reflect on that. Why would people, you know? choose something in their career that puts them inherently in danger. I mean, you can be careful and you can be wise and you'll probably be all right, but you can't control where that next rocket is coming down. Right. And uh, you know, it used to be that correspondents could stay in civilian areas and be relatively safe. That's not the case now and, and not in Ukraine. There is no safe place. Right. Except out on the farm, probably, there's nothing worth bombing out there. So those people probably have it easier. But the disruptions may be keeping them from doing their farming. You know, there's a lot of... It's so hard to get to market. Actually, there isn't a market. Uh, yeah, well, there is if you could get to it. But, but there's, you know, there's planting that is probably not going to get done. And right. Ukraine is one of the major exporters of corn or maize. Um, and wheat. And there are some countries that really depend on those supplies. And if that's disrupted as much as I think it could be, you know, it's just all these inter, you know, all the, the interplay from all these interrelated things that people don't think about uh, very often. Uh, that, it, it, you know, it's already been uh, disrupted. For instance, oh, yeah. Ukraine has blocked all exports of wheat and buckwheat, and Bosnia doesn't get a lot of theirs from Ukraine, but it gets quite a bit of it from Europe. But then Europe, many of the EU countries are now conserving theirs, and then they're not selling to Bosnia. So within the last three weeks, the price of a loaf of bread has gone from 50 cents to uh, $2.50. So it's increased... Much? From fifty cents to two dollars and fifty cents. Wow. But consider that the average monthly salary in Bosnia is two hundred fifty dollars. That's a lot mm -hmm. of money. Yeah, yeah, it's a big in increase. I mean, what five hundred percent? Not trivial. Yeah, there's just going to be a whole lot of foreseeable but unforeseen things that are part of this Indra's web that exists on the material level here on Earth. Is, um, there are just a lot of things. I mean, the supply chain is going to become a problem again. And, uh, of course, China has another big COVID outbreak. And oh, they I have, that. Yeah, they, they have shut down two regions so far. And, you know, if they can't get a handle on it, they'll, you know, be right back where they were before with all these people not going to work and stuff not getting done. I haven't heard a lot of detail about the COVID outbreak. I've just seen it, you know, referred to a number of times, uh, but I haven't heard anybody say what strain it is or anything like that. I haven't dug for the information either. But anyway, it's, you know, just another one of those little things in there or, oh, no, what's that going to do? There's, <laughs> there, you know, there will, there will probably be some African countries who, have their governments overthrown as a result of not being able to import corn, uh, you know, maize or wheat enough of it. Uh, as soon as there are scarcities of food, there's political instability. Right. Um, right. So, you know, it could it wouldn't have to just be third world African countries? It could be other sort of cut off, otherwise cut off communities that don't have a lot of options. It's fascinating how inter connected everything is there's a beauty in it yes uh, yeah, there is. but there's a tragedy in not appreciating it indeed but by the way while we're on a tangent i have another thought about uh, the greatest movie ever made we were talking about robbie robot's introduction no oh, <laughs> yeah right well uh, uh i i think it is uh, very thoughtfully and very skillfully crafted because what, what he says is, I am monitored to respond to the name Ravi. Yeah. What, what he doesn't say is, I am, or that's call right. me. Yes, that's right. And that's, and so that's it, clearly worked out. Yeah, and in many languages, the proper response to being asked your name is to say, I am called, or I yes. call myself. 
uh, uh, this this true, name. True. And I, I mean, I think the people that came up with Robbie, you know, had really been inside some of the early cybernetic. Because um, yeah. I, I so. yeah, I mean, they did a good job, especially for the 50s. I've mentioned it multiple times. I would say the, um, the, the there, there's very few films that I would say really come close to being the best. Um, it's easy. It's easier to make a top five list, but interesting. I, I'd say my criteria for the best comes down to really only two films, both by the same director, Alejandro Jodorowsky, um, <laughs> El Topo and The Holy Mountain. Um, Holy Mountain in particular. I've mentioned it multiple times. I recommend anybody to watch it. It's very, very deep and best experienced while on psychedelics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of movies that might be that way. That's, I, yes. I, I, the, that's an the, argument for that's an argument for drugs. The the writer and director, well, the user of, is is a user of psychedelics, very deeply spiritual person and the film itself is filled with uh esoteric uh symbols any anyway there's there's not really anything more that i can describe but i can say watch it because it's uh one of those few films that actually are almost consciousness altering well uh i've only Neither. seen one of them but i should clearly give it another look um but yeah and, and then what's what's the one that you thought was outstanding was that the holy mountain uh, Holy Mountain, yes. All right. But El, and... El, El, Topo, huh? El Topo's great. El Topo is a spiritual allegory in the form of a cowboy movie. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see how that could be. Um, and and the, uh, the 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 director is what? Alejandro Jodorowsky, Argentinian. Yeah, uh, that'll do it. Argentinian, who was a son of Polish immigrant. Well. That makes it that that kind of thing makes interesting people sometimes. Indeed, indeed. 